Ed and Hamish here from TDM. We thought today we'd just lay down some content that we think is incredibly important for all our portfolio companies. And many of you already are very familiar with our frameworks that we use to not only assess businesses, but more importantly, to understand what makes really great durable businesses. And those three pillars, as all of you are, are more than aware, obviously growth and, and the growth opportunity ahead for a business, the structural competitive advantage and the people and culture, which we hold so dear. We thought today would dig into one of those three. And the reason why we've, we found it really powerful when talking about that framework, just having that shared language with all our portfolio companies has just created a great depth and quality to the conversation. And so we thought we'd do that on one specific topic, and that is around network effects. As many of you know, how we think about structural competitive advantage is based on Hamilton Helmer's seven powers. We, of course, add in the eighth being people and culture. But the most powerful of these seven to us is network effects. And that's what we want to dig into today. And so I thought I'd drag in Hamish because your domain expertise here is far deeper than me. So I'm hoping that I can help facilitate this conversation through your thoughts. Uh, and I guess the key topics that we want to tick off today are, let's start right at the top in terms of what are network effects, why they are so powerful, how we assess them, the different types of network effects, and, and hopefully we can come and, and maybe do a case study at the end. But maybe let's start at the very top. And, and that is, in its simplest form, what are network effects? In its simplest form, it's this idea that you have a product or service. Does the value of the network increase as additional users use the network? So does user utility increase as more users join the network? So a great modern example would be, in its simplest form, is WhatsApp. We all use it. But imagine being the first WhatsApp user and you had no one to send a message to. And then you have the app and I have the app and I can only text you and every single additional user creates greater utility for me as the original user. Yep, perfect example. Okay. And so what, why are they so important? This statement of um, software is eating the world and we know that the internet is pervasive and everything is becoming connected creates an opportunity for businesses of all types to create network effects. So why is that important? Because if you think about what is a fundamental economic driver of business models, it is what is the lifetime value of a customer? Yeah. It's a combination of the customer acquisition cost and customer retention and network effect. The network effects in a business directly affects both of those things. It drives customer acquisition cost down and customer retention up, which increases customer lifetime value. And ultimately that expresses itself in, um, in greater levels of free cash flow and higher free cash flow margins. Every single one of our portfolio companies needs to be thinking about developing network effects in their business, regardless of whether they're an internet company, a software company, a medical device company, or a consumer company. Think back 20 years ago and you look at the top 10 companies by market cap in the world. That was about two and a half trillion dollars of market cap and there was one company that really had network effects as its core competitive advantage and that was Microsoft. Fast forward 20 years and 7.5, 8 trillion dollars worth of market cap, eight of the top 10 companies in the world now have network effects as their core competitive advantage. It's the Facebook, Google, Alibaba. These are generational companies that have been transformational and they've all been driven fundamentally by network effects. If we're just to unravel this a, a bit further, that even within network effects, so 2001, obviously Microsoft, the huge power of, of their network effects even then, but there's been a big transition over the last 20 years in how businesses have used network effect and the, the varying powers of those network effects over the last 20 years. Yeah, and we've, we've observed, broadly speaking, five 
key phases of how network effects have developed, certainly in terms of how we've thought about it and what we've invested in. The first phase was traditional marketplaces. For us, it was stock exchanges and financial exchanges um, going through a digitization phase where trading became globalized and electronic. And those natural monopolies uh, and the network effects that applied to them just massively increased in scale because they became global in nature and the internet enabled that. We went through a phase then of um, the online disruptive um, phase of network effects changing industries and we saw this with online classifieds in travel and real estate. The next phase for us was then it was a data liberation, data democratization phase and it was what um, the core of network effects was this idea of liberating data for everyone's benefit who had access to the internet and open table was a great example of that the next phase more recent um, has been a software driven phase where software companies that are the primary go to market was initially with a software product then started developing network effects around their business model square being a great example of company that's executed very well there. Uh, And the final piece, which we think is really, really exciting and where we think there is huge opportunity um, going forward is around um, the combination of the last two phases, data and software, and what AI and machine learning can do for network effects, because you've got huge data aggregation possibilities applying AI and machine learning to, and Spotify is a great example of this, where um, the personalization and discovery uh, benefits to end users um, and the network effects that that creates, we think is super powerful. So, Hamos, having laid that foundational stone so well for everyone that's watching, maybe you can describe the three different types of network effects. Yeah, for sure. Let's get into that. Before we do get into that, I should say there's nothing particularly original here. These are all existing, um, more or less existing concepts. We do introduce some potentially some new language around that and kind of how we think about the different categories. Yeah, and and there's lots of information out there, isn't it, on network effects and, and how we think about it internally and how you're articulating it might be different to how other people are reading it if they're doing some digging around. But as you said, it's it's that common language that is so important that can then make the depth and quality of the connections that we're making when discussing it. Yeah, we've found it helpful. And so we think about three broad categories of network effects. Direct network effects, two-sided networks, and what we call hybrid networks, which as the name suggests is a combination of the two. And now I will say that like everything in life, there's no black or white here and there are shades of grey um, with how we categorise these. But generally speaking, we do categorise them into those three broad areas. And there are, there are subcategories of each and, and maybe let's walk through those. So l- yeah. let's start with the direct network. So when we think about direct network effects, it's very much around how homogenous is the user base. If it's a homogenous user base, then we think about it as a direct network. And when we think about these direct networks, we think about four different subcategories, peer-to-peer networks, marketplaces, freemium software, and they're classically freemium software business models, and finally, what we call customer acquisition and retention uh, models. So a couple of examples of peer-to-peer networks, you use WhatsApp, perfect example of a peer-to-peer network in messaging. Uh, Another example would be uh, Square's Cash App business, which is a peer-to-peer financial service. On the marketplace side of things, uh, these examples are more uh, obvious, but there is a nuance around here that we try to highlight. So the New York Stock Exchange, we consider to be a direct network. Now, At a transactional level, there's a buyer and a seller, classically, on um, every side of a transaction. But the buyer or the seller is just as likely to be a buyer or seller uh, on the other side of a transaction in any given day. And so the user base is very much homogenous of the New York Stock Exchange. And it's probably worth noting that many people would probably 
automatically jump to that's a two-sided network you have a buyer and a seller Absolutely. And so for us, and it's just a definitional thing and it helps the way we think about how the network effects actually work. Um, at a transactional level, yes, buyer or seller, but at a network effect level, the user is homogenous. So eBay is another example where certainly the genesis of eBay, the users of eBay were generally speaking more homogenous. Now we're in a more gray area now with eBay where there are some sellers on eBay that are never buyers, and like myself, I'm a buyer of e on eBay, but never a seller. But generally speaking, we think we say that that user base of eBay, uh, the eBay marketplace, is homogenous. The third category are the freemium software business model. So, a couple of examples here. Uh, if you've got uh, a young kid, you probably come across Fortnite, uh, social gaming, where it's a free-to-play video game. The more users of the video game, the more utility for the users in the video game, and they monetize that with microtransactions um, within the game itself. Another example uh, in the corporate software space is Slack, where you've got corporate so software messaging platform. The more users, the more utility there is for that messaging platform, very much in the same way as WhatsApp but it's monetized with a freemium software business model. The final one where we have two of our portfolio companies are really good examples here is customer acquisition and retention um, and how direct network effects can really drive that aspect of the business model. So safety culture and culture amp are two examples if we take uh, culture amp. So we think the global leader in um, uh, software solution in organizational culture They've developed by virtue of all the users of their software, these wonderful benchmarks around organizational culture. And they've got dozens of benchmarks around different uh, organization types, different demographics, different um, trying to understand different cultural aspects within a business. So if I'm thinking about what culture software solution to use, uh, I'm gonna be more attracted to using CultureAmp because of these rich culture benchmarks that they've developed by virtue of the thousands of customers that bend their information into them. So that's direct networks. What about two-sided networks? So as the name suggests, two very distinct sides, the demand side and the supply side. And how do we distinguish between the two? It's really which way does the money flow and which way do the goods and services flow? So. The money flows from the demand side to the supply side. The goods and services flow from the supply side to the demand side. The network platform sits in the middle and that is the business that reaps the benefit of the connectivity between the two. So Hamo, there are some nuances around two-sided network effects and maybe it's best to illustrate those nuances through some examples maybe. Yeah, so some examples are open table where you've got diners on the demand side, you've got restaurants on the supply side. Spotify, another portfolio company where you have listeners on the demand side and labels and musicians on the supply side. Uh, another example would be Airbnb where you've got people booking, uh, booking stays on, one, on the demand side. On the supply side, you have hosts that are providing the places to stay. So what about a Shopify, for instance? The Shopify, more of a nuanced example where that started off as a software business and then developed network effects um, using, uh, on the demand side, the merchants that use their software, they created a platform that they were a then able to supply applications, value-added applications and features to their merchants. So that was a value added functionality to their merchants on the demand side. The benefit for the apps on the supply side getting access to all those customers. And I think we've probably forgotten the biggest one of all and that's Google. So Google very much to us a two-sided network where you have people that are searching for information on the demand side, on the supply side you have advertisers. Perfect. So this brings us to probably the most interesting of network effects that being the hybrid network effects and as it suggests a combination of direct and two-sided and, and maybe you can give a bit more color around exactly how this looks okay yeah so direct network effects have a baby with two-sided network effects and you get the hybrid network on the demand side you have direct network effects 
on the supply side, you have supplies to the demand side. So that's the general concept. Classic examples are social networks. So we would say that Facebook and Twitter are hybrid network, hybrid, have hybrid network effects as a key part of their business model or as a fundamental part of their business model. Peer-to-peer -peer social aspect, the more users on Facebook, the greater utility for every user. Great example, and they um, monetize that direct network by supplying advertising to those uh, users on the demand side. And obviously the more demand you have and the greater the network effect, the more likely the supply gets sucked in and, and they feed each other in that sense. Exactly, and that's why these are such super powerful business models because you've got the power of the two network effects. You've got the power of the direct network effects on the demand side, and then you have the power of the two-sided network, network as the two interact. And we'll come back to the, the power of this network and we'll come back to the power of all the networks because it's interesting to, to compare and contrast. But there are three different types of, of hybrid networks. So I think it's probably worth going through each of those. Yeah, so we think about the three different types. So you've got social networks like Facebook and Twitter. You've got um, content-based networks and classically user-generated content networks. So two good examples, Pinterest and YouTube where, so take YouTube for example, you've got huge uh, user-generated content and direct network effects around that on the demand side, and you have the supply of advertising likewise with Pinterest. And the third? Uh, the third example are what we call dual monetized network effects. Again, super powerful, classic example is LinkedIn, where on the demand side, you've got LinkedIn users where you've got a freemium software business model. Yes, you can use LinkedIn for free, but if you pay to be a premium user, you get value added functionality. So the demand side is getting monetized, whereas the previous examples we used, um, it's classically free for the demand side. They also monetize the network on the supply side. So you know, recruiters uh, pay to access the LinkedIn platform for their recruiting uh, business. And so that is the supply, that is how they monetize, one example of how they monetize the supply side. And advertisers would be another example on the supply exactly. side. So it's great to have that overall picture now. And I guess what is interesting is the nuances, particularly when companies are coming to formulate strategies around trying to not only assess, but implement network effects. And so maybe it's worth digging in there. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting area because when we think about strategies to create network effects, there are two kind of broad categories that we think about, user aggregation power and platform utility power, and they're very much um, intertwined. How we use these concepts explicitly within TDM to assess network effects and then to assess strategies about how we can make them stronger uh, is a really simple matrix. On the horizontal axis, we've got user aggregation power. On the vertical axis, we've got platform utility power. And we literally plot uh, the companies that uh, we are investing in or we're invested in uh, on that matrix to get an understanding and really a subjective assessment of how strong is their network effect. And the idea is that we want our companies to move up and to the right. And so if you were to put that in, in layman's terms, the aggregation power? Yeah, so user aggregation power, whether it's a direct network or a two-sided network, is very much around how good a job at, has the network done at aggregating potential users of that network. So if you, if you take Facebook, for example, they've done an incredible job of aggregating the world's population as part of their social network. And what about utility power? So platform utility power is related, but also separate to this idea of user aggregation. Platform utility power is derived from user aggregation, but it can also be independent of user aggregation. It's this idea of how much utility does every user of the platform get from using the platform? Yeah. So using this framework, and I think it will become more apparent as we go through each network effect, uh, how would you assess a direct network and the power of that? 
So perhaps the best to use a, a real life example. So WhatsApp, uh, an example of a direct network that has done an incredible job of user aggregation. So certainly over a billion uh, daily users of WhatsApp. Uh, despite the fact that there were many messaging platforms available for many, many people to use um, as that business grew, but that user base grew very, very rapidly. So incredible job on the user aggregation side of things, but where they've done, I think, an exceptional job is around platform utility to those users, even independent of the fact that uh, the user base has grown significantly. Uh, so you think about some of the features and functionality that WhatsApp have layered into um, uh, to their messaging platform that distinguishes it from uh, iMessaging as an example. So they've built platform utility independent of just the user aggregation, but the user aggregation has also been incredibly powerful. Yeah, so if you're assessing the network effect, high user aggregation, high utility of the platform, very powerful network effect. Absolutely. So moving on to the, the next network effect, two-sided network, let's apply this, this framework. Yeah, so I mean, the framework applies in exactly the same way. The thing we distinguish here is that we really focus on uh, both user aggregation on the demand side and the supply side. We think about platform utility to both the demand side and the supply side. But what do we really care about the most in terms of assessing the strength? It's the demand side. We're trying to optimize for demand side user aggregation and platform utility because we've found that over time, if that is optimized, the supply side will come. Yeah, and the supply side will not only get sucked in, but when you think of aggregating the supply, it actually doesn't create a network effect in itself. It just probably lowers your cost of doing business. Absolutely. And the supply side are always want to get access to the demand side. So the more you can build that demand side, and we've seen a whole bunch of two-sided network effects that have uh, just built the demand side many, many years before they even plug the supply side in. And so well, I think we're now getting the idea of, of the framework, but to a hybrid network effect. So the strength of the hybrid network effect is really just a combination of both of those things that we talked about. And classically, they do start out as direct network effects first, uh, and then they plug in the supply side. Social networks being a great example. So, and I think Facebook's a kind of interesting example where they built uh, that demand side, that social network at massive scale, and then slowly monetized with advertising over over time to the point now where you'd say it's diminishing utility almost diminishing utility to the demand side given the amount of supply side advertising. Yeah. So I think this is a a great point in time to maybe map out how different businesses have used this and this kind of framework to not only uh, assess their network effects but to strengthen them and to be more powerful over time and a few of the strategies that were put in place to do that? So to use an example of a company that is way up there uh, in the right hand quadrant is Google. Yeah. Probably where, the highest, really. Yeah, probably it'd certainly have to be one of the highest where they've done an incredible job around user aggregation. Uh, and that's probably what they, well not probably, that is what they optimized for in the early days. So. They were high on the, um, the vertical access being platform utility to users. And then over time, they, as user aggregation increased, they moved up and to the right to where they are now, which is they've done an awesome job on user aggregation and platform utility. And so another example that is interesting, because I mean, that kind of is up and to the right and has been for a long time, but let's map the journey maybe of something like a, a Netflix. Netflix 2011, let's start there. So Netflix 2011, Netflix, and it's an interesting one because it's one of those examples where it's a business model that is uh, dependent on that minimum viable supply of content. And back in 2011, very much dependent on the supply of content from the big content creators. Yeah. Having said that, they've done an awesome job in terms of user aggregation. It was early on in their streaming business, but they were still doing an awesome job of aggregating 
users around this amazing streaming experience that they were starting to deliver, deliver back in those days. So not only was streaming new, but it was this wonderful user experience that people flocked to because of the ability of to watch anything on demand, but also in this wonderful interface. Exactly. So you think about the platform they were delivering independent of supply. So back in the DVD days, they had the same, same supply of content, but they had this transformational platform utility event of streaming uh, video, which help them move up and to the right. So independent of user aggregation, but it also propelled user aggregation. Let's fast forward to 2020, because they have moved up and to the right and there's been a step change in that business. And I know where you're gonna take this, but what has, what has caused that? So what, what was the other transformational thing they did? Original content. Original content. So again, they created more platform utility independent of supply by creating their own proprietary content on the platform. And so what that does is deliver more platform utility to the users, to the Netflix, Netflix customers, and moves them up and to the right, delivers more platform utility, delivers more user aggregation, the network effect and that flywheel just keeps spinning faster and faster. Great example and probably my favorite. Uh, one similar to that is is Spotify, and I, I guess that's probably worth talking to as well. Yeah, so Spotify, it's a, it's a really similar example in that it started off with the minimum viable supply of content, but you think about what they're doing around uh, podcasts at the moment. In the last 12 months, they've invested many, many hundreds of millions of dollars in proprietary podcast content that you're not gonna be able to get on other podcast platforms. So they're now delivering more platform utility independent of the supply of music and other podcasts on their platform that you just can't get in the Apple podcast app anymore, for example. Great example. So we've talked about two businesses that are, are moving up and to the right and, and maybe an example of somewhere that has diminishing platform utility. We, we touched on it earlier, but it's probably worth elaborating on this one. Yeah, I mean, this could be a controversial example, Facebook. So. Clearly, they've done an amazing job building user aggregation on the Facebook platform. I mean, billions of users globally, awesome job. And they have done a really good job uh, over the years of uh, delivering platform utility in a whole range of different ways. But our personal in-house view of where Facebook uh, has gone wrong is the supply of advertising has really saturated the Facebook user experience on the demand side to the point where we think it turns into diminishing platform utility for demand side users. There's just too much advertising that isn't relevant for users in our opinion. Yeah, so to, to put this in layman's term, the reason why I use Facebook in the first place was to connect with my friends. The more friends I had, the better the experience. They started serving up a few ads it became interesting because the algorithm knows what I like, but all of a sudden I don't get to see my friends and what they're doing. And as each one leaves, my uh, utility is diminished. Exactly. And so that's our personal view. And that, that's, the, um, that's one of the tricky things with uh, that type of business model where you do have the two sides of, sides of the networks collide and you potentially get diminishing returns to one side or the other. Let's try if we can to pull all of this together and get a real life example of where the power of network effects has really catapulted a business into the stratosphere compared to its competitors. And the best one that probably comes to mind and it's local and, and relevant is Canva and Shutterstock. And, and you live this real time and so maybe you can give some color in, and some compare and contrast between those two businesses. Yeah, so the, the reason we love this example is because it's one of our, the bigger mistakes we've made. Conceptually where Shutterstock, we would have put Shutterstock on the matrix uh, back in 2015 is pretty high on the user aggregation side of things. I mean, they've done an incredible job there, but pretty low on the platform utility. It, it's not that it didn't have platform utility, it's just that the platform utility was very much dependent on the user aggregation piece. There wasn't a lot of platform utility independent of the supply of stock content. 
Canva on the other side of things, very low on the user aggregation, just given it was very early days for them, but uh, much higher on the platform utility piece, um, independent of supply. So you could use the Canva solution back in those days, um, still have a wonderful uh, experience in terms of developing content, uh, but it was much earlier on the stage of development. And, and since then, obviously Canva's moved up and to the right. Yeah, so I mean, what's happened since then, even like five years, a short period of time. So if you think about the relative market caps in 2015, when we sold Shutterstock, market cap was $2 billion, billion US. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what Canva's valuation was there, but it would have been maybe a couple of hundred million dollars. Fast forward five years later, market cap of Shutterstock is actually down. It's about $1.7 billion. So revenue hasn't grown and the company value as assessed by the market is lower than what it was five years ago. Canva uh, is was did their latest round at $6 billion valuation. US. US. In five years, you have a massive valuation change. So the incumbent who was the market leader is basically been dwindled to the background as this little startup in, in Sydney has taken control. And now it's three times the size. Yeah, and growing exponentially. What a, It's a, a wonderful case study. And so what would you say the biggest takeaway from this particular case study would be? The key takeaway for us and, and why I think it's such a powerful example is uh, it, it goes to the power of platform utility independent of supply uh, especially as it relates to the demand side of a two-sided network. So having given a, what you'd call a compare and contrast case study, why don't we just go deep on one business and, and give an example of a business that has added to their network effects over time in a variety of ways and how that has played out. The example I use here is Square. And I'd say it's still playing out. Yeah. And we think it's still early days in terms of how it plays out. And there, what they've done is something really special. So they created this awesome um, software solution for merchants at the point of sale. That's built uh, about a $2 billion revenue business. It's growing really strongly. And it's, a, um, it's an amazing business in and of itself. Independent of that, they've created this incredible and one of the fastest growing businesses at scale of all time, um, business called Cash App. So that's a billion dollars of revenue growing at 150% per annum. Crazy to think. So just get your head around yeah. that idea, a billion dollars growing at 150% per annum. And what that is, is a peer-to-peer -peer network um, for financial services, predominantly in the US, but it's coming to Australia, it's going to the UK. Um, we think it has real global application. So if we think about them on the matrix, what are they doing? Well, they're building the demand side of the network with Cash App, with this really fast growing, um, fast user aggregation platform utility, direct network effects on the demand side. And they've got thousands and thousands of merchants on the supply side. So what we think about a lot and what Square is talking about is, well, can they create the hybrid network and connect the two together? For them to achieve that, they become essentially the new age JP Morgan. We think it becomes the bank of the future. Yeah, fascinating case study and I can't wait to see how that plays out. And we're, we're betting on it, so we're believers, but they're doing an awesome job in executing it. So Hamer, I've, I've loved this and I'm sure many other people watching have also. And, and so let's bring it all together in one last little chunk. Yeah, so if, if you bring it all together, I think about, I really think about three things. Uh, number one is that it doesn't matter what your business is, you need to be thinking about how you're developing network effects with, within your business because Software, the internet, it is becoming pervasive. Everything is becoming connected. So what do you have there with that massive connectivity? You then have massive data aggregation. So when thinking about the next five or 10 years, we think about how that connectivity and data aggregation then lends itself to AI and machine learning in developing those network effects. Why is that important? Because it optimizes the customer experience. It's a huge opportunity. We think it's really early days, 
but it's going to pervade all industries, not just software and the internet. The final one is really around this idea of developing platform utility independent of supply. So yes, user aggregation is powerful and it is critical, uh, but regardless of where the network effect starts, you have to think about moving up to the right of that matrix. And to do that, you have to be developing platform utility independent of the supply. A great wrap. I hope everyone's loved this deep dive into the strongest of the structural competitive advantages, that being network effects. And hopefully we can dig into a few more soon, Hamo. Sounds good, it was fun. <laughs>